Chapter 23 of The Birth of Tragedy or Hellenism and Pessimism by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by William Hausmann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 23. He who wishes to test himself rigorously as to how he is related to the true aesthetic hearer, or whether he belongs, rather, to the community of the Socrato-critical man, has only to inquire sincerely concerning the sentiment with which he accepts the wonder represented on the stage. Whether he feels his historical sense, which insists on strict psychological causality, insulted by it, whether, with benevolent concession, he, as it were, admits the wonder as a phenomenon intelligible to childhood, but relinquished by him, or whether he experiences anything else thereby. For he will thus be enabled to determine how far he is, on the whole, capable of understanding myth, that is to say, the concentrated picture of the world, which as abbreviature of phenomena cannot dispense with wonder. It is probable, however, that nearly every one, upon close examination, feels so disintegrated by the critico-historical spirit of our culture, that he can only perhaps make the former existence of myth credible to himself, by learned means through intermediary abstractions. Without myth, however, every culture loses its healthy, creative, natural power. It is only a horizon encompassed with myths which rounds off to unity a social movement. It is only by myth that all the powers of the imagination and of the Apollonian dream are freed from their random rovings. The mythical figures have to be the invisibly omnipresent genii, under the care of which the young soul grows to maturity, by the signs of which the man gives a meaning to his life and struggles. And the state itself knows no more powerful unwritten law than the mythical foundation which vouches for its connection with religion and its growth from mythical ideas. Let us now place alongside thereof the abstract man, proceeding independently of myth, the abstract education, the abstract usage, the abstract right, the abstract state. Let us picture to ourselves the lawless roving of the artistic imagination, not bridled by any native myth. Let us imagine a culture which has no fixed and sacred primitive seal, but is doomed to exhaust all its possibilities, and has to nourish itself wretchedly from the other cultures. Such is the present, as the result of Socratism which is bent on the destruction of myth. And now the mythless man remains eternally hungering among all the bygones and digs and grubs for roots, though he have to dig for them even among the remotest antiquities. The stupendous historical exigency of the unsatisfied modern culture, the gathering around one of countless other cultures, the consuming desire for knowledge. What does all this point to? If not to the loss of myth, the loss of the mythical home, the mythical source? Let us ask ourselves whether the feverish and so uncanny stirring of this culture is aught but the eager seizing and snatching at food of the hungerer. And who would care to contribute anything more to a culture which cannot be appeased by all it devours, and in contact with which the most vigorous and wholesome nourishment is wont to change into, quote, history and criticism, end quote. We should also have to regard our German character with despair and sorrow, if it had already become inextricably entangled in, or even identical with this culture in a similar manner as we can observe it to our horror, to be the case in civilized France. And that which for a long time was the great advantage of France, and the cause of her vast preponderance, to wit, 
this very identity of people and culture, might compel us at the sight thereof to congratulate ourselves that this culture of ours, which is so questionable, has hitherto had nothing in common with the noble kernel of the character of our people. All our hopes, on the contrary, stretch out longingly toward the perception that beneath this restlessly palpitating civilized life and educational convulsion, there is concealed a glorious, intrinsically healthy, primeval power, which, to be sure, stirs vigorously only at intervals in stupendous moments, and then dreams on again, in view of a future awakening. It is from this abyss that the German Reformation came forth, in the choral hymn of which the future melody of German music first resounded, so deep, courageous, and soul-breathing. So exuberantly good and tender did this chorale of Luther sound, as the first Dionysian luring call, which breaks forth from dense thickets at the approach of spring. To it responded with emulative echo the solemnly wanton procession of Dionysian revelers, to whom we are indebted for German music, and to whom we shall be indebted for the rebirth of German myth. I know that I must now lead the sympathizing and attentive friend to an elevated position of lonesome contemplation, where he will have but few companions, and I call out encouragingly to him that we must hold fast to our shining guides, the Greeks. For the rectification of our aesthetic knowledge we previously borrowed from them the two divine figures, each of which sways a separate realm of art, and concerning whose mutual contact and exaltation we have acquired a notion through Greek tragedy. Through a remarkable disruption of both these primitive artistic impulses, the ruin of Greek tragedy seemed to be necessarily brought about, with which process a degeneration and a transmutation of the Greek national character was strictly in keeping, summoning us to earnest reflection as to how closely and necessarily art and the people, myth and custom, tragedy and the state, have coalesced in their bases. The ruin of tragedy was at the same time the ruin of myth. Until then, the Greeks had been involuntarily compelled immediately to associate all experiences with their myths. Indeed, they had to comprehend them only through this association. Whereby, even the most immediate present necessarily appeared to them subspecie eterni, and in a certain sense, as timeless. Into this current of the timeless, however, the state as well as art plunged in order to find repose from the burden and eagerness of the moment. And a people, for the rest also a man, is worth just as much only as its ability to impress on its experiences the seal of eternity. For it is thus, as it were, desecularized, and reveals its unconscious inner conviction of the relativity of time and of the true, that is, the metaphysical significance of life. The contrary happens when a people begins to comprehend itself historically and to demolish the mythical bulwarks around it, with which there is usually connected a marked secularization, a breach with the unconscious metaphysics of its earlier existence in all ethical consequences. Greek art, and especially Greek tragedy, delayed above all the annihilation of myth. It was necessary to annihilate these also to be able to live detached from the native soil, unbridled in the wilderness of thought, custom, and action. Even in such circumstances, this metaphysical impulse still endeavors to create for itself a form of apotheosis, weakened, no doubt, in the Socratism of science urging to life, 
but on its lower stage this same impulse led only to a feverous search, which gradually merged into a pandemonium of myths and superstitions, accumulated from all quarters, in the midst of which, nevertheless, the Hellene sat with a yearning heart till he contrived, as Greculus, to mask his fever with Greek cheerfulness and Greek levity, or to narcotize himself completely with some gloomy oriental superstition. We have approached this condition in the most striking manner since the reawakening of the Alexandro-Roman antiquity in the fifteenth century, after a long, not easily describable interlude. On the heights there is the same exuberant love of knowledge, the same insatiate happiness of the discoverer, the same stupendous secularization, and together with these a homeless roving about. An eager intrusion at foreign tables, a frivolous deification of the present, or a dull, senseless estrangement. All subspecies seculi of the present time. Which same symptoms lead one to infer the same defect at the heart of this culture, the annihilation of myth. It seems hardly possible to transplant a foreign myth with permanent success, without dreadfully injuring the tree through this transplantation, which is perhaps occasionally strong enough and sound enough to eliminate the foreign element after a terrible struggle but must ordinarily consume itself in a languishing and stunted condition or in sickly luxuriance. Our opinion of the pure and vigorous kernel of the German being is such that we venture to expect of it, and only of it, this elimination of forcibly ingrafted foreign elements, and we deem it possible that the German spirit will reflect anew on itself. Perhaps many a one will be of opinion that this spirit must begin its struggles with the elimination of the Romanic element, for which it might recognize an external preparation and encouragement in the victorious bravery and bloody glory of the late war, but must seek the inner constraint in the emulative zeal to be forever worthy of the sublime protagonists on this path, of Luther as well as our great artists and poets. But let him never think he can fight such battles without his household gods, without his mythical home, without a, quote, restoration, end quote, of all German things. And if the German should look timidly around for a guide to lead him back to his long-lost home, the ways and paths of which he knows no longer, let him but listen to the delightfully luring call of the Dionysian bird, which hovers above him, and would fain point out to him the way thither. End of chapter 23. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 24 of The Birth of Tragedy or Hellenism and Pessimism by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by William Hausmann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 24. Among the peculiar artistic effects of musical tragedy, we had to emphasize an Apollonian illusion, through which we are to be saved from immediate oneness with the Dionysian music. While our musical excitement is able to discharge itself on an Apollonian domain, and in an interposed, visible middle world. It thereby seemed to us that precisely through this discharge, the middle world of theatrical procedure, the drama generally, became visible and intelligible from within in a degree unattainable in the other forms of Apollonian art. So that here, where this art was, as it were, winged and borne aloft by the spirit of music, we had to recognize the highest exaltation of its powers. And consequently, in the fraternal union of Apollo and Dionysus, the climax of the Apollonian 
as well as of the Dionysian artistic aims. Of course, the Apollonian light picture did not, precisely with this inner illumination through music, attain the peculiar effect of the weaker grades of Apollonian art. What the epos and the animated stone can do, constrain the contemplating eye to calm delight in the world of the individuatio, could not be realized here, notwithstanding the greater animation and distinctness. We contemplated the drama, and penetrated with piercing glance into its inner agitated world of motives, and yet it seemed as if only a symbolic picture passed before us, the profoundest significance of which we almost believed we had divined, and which we desired to put aside like a curtain in order to behold the original behind it. The greatest distinctness of the picture did not suffice us, for it seemed to reveal as well as veil something. And while it seemed, with its symbolic revelation, to invite the rending of the veil for the disclosure of the mysterious background, this illumined all conspicuousness itself enthralled the eye and prevented it from penetrating more deeply. He who has not experienced this to have to view and at the same time to have a longing beyond the viewing, will hardly be able to conceive how clearly and definitely these two processes coexist in the contemplation of tragic myth and are felt to be conjoined. While the truly aesthetic spectators will confirm my assertion that among the peculiar effects of tragedy this conjunction is the most noteworthy. Now, let this phenomenon of the aesthetic spectator be transferred to an analogous process in the tragic artist, and the genesis of tragic myth will have been understood. It shares with the Apollonian sphere of art the full delight in appearance and contemplation, and at the same time it denies this delight and finds a still higher satisfaction in the annihilation of the visible world of appearance. The substance of tragic myth is first of all an epic event, involving the glorification of the fighting hero. But whence originates the essentially enigmatical trait, that the suffering in the fate of the hero, the most painful victories, the most agonizing contrasts of motives, in short, the exemplification of the wisdom of Silenus, or, aesthetically expressed, the ugly and discordant, is always represented anew, in such countless forms, with such predilection, and precisely in the most youthful and exuberant age of a people, unless there is really a higher delight experienced in all this. For the fact that things actually take such a tragic course would least of all explain the origin of a form of art, provided that art is not merely an imitation of the reality of nature, but in truth a metaphysical supplement to the reality of nature, placed alongside thereof for its conquest. Tragic myth, insofar as it really belongs to art, also fully participates in this transfiguring metaphysical purpose of art in general. What does it transfigure, however, when it presents the phenomenal world in the guise of the suffering hero? Least of all the, quote, reality, end quote, of this phenomenal world, for it says to us, quote, Look at this. Look carefully. It is your life. It is the hour hand of your clock of existence. End quote. And myth has displayed this life in order thereby to transfigure it to us? If not, how shall we account for the aesthetic pleasure with which we make even these representations pass before us? I am inquiring concerning the aesthetic pleasure 
and am well aware that many of these representations may, moreover, occasionally create even a moral delectation. Say under the form of pity, or of a moral triumph. But he who would derive the effect of the tragic exclusively from these moral sources, as was usually the case far too long in aesthetics, let him not think that he has done anything for art thereby. For art must above all insist on purity in her domain. For the explanation of tragic myth, the very first requirement is that the pleasure which characterizes it must be sought in the purely aesthetic sphere, without encroaching on the domain of pity, fear, or the morally sublime. How can the ugly and the discordant, the substance of tragic myth, excite an aesthetic pleasure? Here it is necessary to raise ourselves with a daring bound into a metaphysics of art. I repeat, therefore, my former proposition, that it is only as an aesthetic phenomenon that existence and the world appear justified. And in this sense, it is precisely the function of tragic myth to convince us that even the ugly and discordant is an artistic game which the will, in the eternal fullness of its joy, plays with itself. But this not easily comprehensible proto-phenomenon of Dionysian art becomes, in a direct way, singularly intelligible and is immediately apprehended in the wonderful significance of musical dissonance. Just as in general it is music alone, placed in contrast to the world, which can give us an idea as to what is meant by the justification of the world as an aesthetic phenomenon. The joy that tragic myth excites has the same origin as the joyful sensation of dissonance in music. The Dionysian, with its primitive joy experienced in pain itself, is the common source of music and tragic myth. Is it not possible that by calling to our aid the musical relation of dissonance, the difficult problem of tragic effect, may have meanwhile been materially facilitated? For we now understand what it means to wish to view tragedy, and at the same time to have a longing beyond the viewing, a frame of mind which, as regards the artistically employed dissonance, we should simply have to characterize by saying that we desire to hear, and at the same time have a longing beyond the hearing. That striving for the infinite the pinion flapping of longing, accompanying the highest delight in the clearly perceived reality. Remind one that in both states we have to recognize a Dionysian phenomenon, which again and again reveals to us anew the playful upbuilding and demolishing of the world of individuals as the efflux of a primitive delight. In like manner, as when Heraclitus the Obscure compares the world-building power to a playing child which places stones here and there and builds sand hills only to overthrow them again. Hence, in order to form a true estimate of the Dionysian capacity of a people, it would seem that we must think not only of their music, but just as much of their tragic myth, the second witness of this capacity. Considering this most intimate relationship between music and myth, we may now in like manner suppose that a degeneration and deprivation of the one involves a deterioration of the other. If it be true at all that the weakening of the myth is generally expressive of a debilitation of the Dionysian capacity. Concerning both, however, 
A glance at the development of the German genius should not leave us in any doubt. In the opera, just as in the abstract character of our mythless existence. In an art sunk to pastime, just as in a life guided by concepts, the inartistic as well as life-consuming nature of Socratic optimism had revealed itself to us. Yet there have been indications to console us, and nevertheless in some inaccessible abyss the German spirit still rests and dreams. Undestroyed, in glorious health, profundity, and Dionysian strength, like a knight sunk in slumber, from which abyss the Dionysian song rises to us to let us know that this German knight even still dreams his primitive Dionysian myth in blissfully earnest visions. Let no one believe that the German spirit has forever lost its mythical home when it still understands so obviously the voices of the birds which tell of that home. Some day it will find itself awake in all the morning freshness of a deep sleep. Then it will slay the dragons, destroy the malignant dwarfs, and waken Brunhilde, and Wotan's spirit self will be unable to obstruct its course. My friends, ye who believe in Dionysian music, ye know also what tragedy means to us. There we have tragic myth born anew from music. And in this latest birth, ye can hope for everything and forget what is most afflicting. What is most afflicting to all of us, however, is the prolonged degradation in which the German genius has lived estranged from house and home in the service of malignant dwarfs. Ye understand my illusion, as ye will also, in conclusion, understand my hopes. End of chapter 24. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 25 of The Birth of Tragedy or Hellenism and Pessimism by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by William Hausmann This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 25. Music and Tragic Myth are equally the expression of the Dionysian capacity of a people and are inseparable from each other. Both originate in an ultra-Apollonian sphere of art. Both transfigure a region into the delightful accords of which all dissonance, just like the terrible picture of the world, dies charmingly away. Both play with the sting of displeasure, trusting to their most potent magic. Both justify thereby the existence even of the, quote, worst world, end quote. Here, the Dionysian, as compared with the Apollonian, exhibits itself as the eternal and original artistic force, which in general calls into existence the entire world of phenomena, in the midst of which a new transfiguring appearance becomes necessary, in order to keep alive the animated world of individuation. If we could conceive an incarnation of dissonance, and what is man but that, then to be able to live this dissonance would require a glorious illusion, which would spread a veil of beauty over its peculiar nature. This is the true function of Apollo as deity of art, in whose name we comprise all the countless manifestations of the fair realm of illusion with each moment render life in general worth living and make one impatient for the experience of the next moment. At the same time, 
just as much of this basis of all existence, the Dionysian substratum of the world, is allowed to enter into the consciousness of human beings, as can be surmounted again by the Apollonian transfiguring power, so that these two art impulses are constrained to develop their powers in strictly mutual proportion, according to the law of eternal justice. When the Dionysian powers rise, with such vehemence as we experience at present, there can be no doubt, veiled in a cloud, Apollo has already descended to us, whose grandest beautifying influences a coming generation will perhaps behold. That this effect is necessary, however, each one would most surely perceive by intuition, if once he found himself carried back, even in a dream, into an old Hellenic existence. In walking under high Ionic colonnades, looking upwards to a horizon defined by clear and noble lines, with reflections of his transfigured form by his side in shining marble, and around him, solemnly marching or quietly moving men, with harmoniously sounding voices and rhythmical pantomime. Would he not, in the presence of this perpetual influx of beauty, have to raise his hand to Apollo and exclaim, quote, Blessed race of Hellenes, how great Dionysus must be among you, when the Delian god deems such charms necessary to cure you of your dithyrambic madness. End quote. To one in this frame of mind, however, an aged Athenian looking up to him with the sublime eye of Aeschylus might answer, quote, Say also this, thou curious stranger. What sufferings this people must have undergone in order to be able to become thus beautiful. But now follow me to a tragic play and sacrifice with me in the temple of both the deities. End quote. End of chapter 25. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Appendix and Translator's Note of the Birth of Tragedy or Hellenism and Pessimism by Friedrich Nietzsche. Translated by William Hausmann. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Appendix. Translator's Note. Late in the year 1888, not long before he was overcome by his sudden attack of insanity, Nietzsche wrote down a few notes concerning his early work, The Birth of Tragedy. These were printed in his sister's biography, Das Leben Friedrich Nietzsches, Volume 2, Part 1, pages 102 and so on, and are here translated as likely to be of interest to readers of this remarkable work. They also appear in Ecce Homo. End translator's note. 1. To be just to the birth of tragedy, one will have to forget some few things. It has wrought effects. It even fascinated through that wherein it was amiss, through its application to Wagnerism, just as if this Wagnerism were symptomatic of a rise and going up. And just on that account was the book an event in Wagner's life. From thence, and only from thence, were great hopes linked to the name of Wagner. Even today, People remind me sometimes, right in the midst of a talk on Parsifal, that I, and none other, have it on my conscience that such a high opinion of the cultural value of this movement came to the top. More than once have I found the book referred to as, quote, the rebirth of tragedy out of the spirit of music, end quote. One only had an ear for a new formula of Wagner's art, aim, task, 
and failed to hear withal what was at bottom valuable therein. Quote, Hellenism and Pessimism, end quote, had been a more unequivocal title, namely, as a first lesson on the way in which the Greeks got the better of pessimism, on the means whereby they overcame it. Tragedy simply proves that the Greeks were no pessimists. Schopenhauer was mistaken here as he was mistaken in all other things. Considered with some neutrality, the birth of tragedy appears very unseasonable. One would not even dream that it was begun amid the thunders of the Battle of Wörth. I thought these problems through and through before the walls of Metz, in cold September nights, in the midst of the work of nursing the sick. One might even believe the book to be fifty years older. It is politically indifferent. Un-German, one will say today. It smells shockingly Hegelian. In but a few formulae does its scent of Schopenhauer's funereal perfume. In, quote, idea, end quote. The antithesis of, quote, Dionysian versus Apollonian, end quote. Translated into metaphysics. History itself as the evolution of this, quote, idea, end quote. The antithesis dissolved into oneness in tragedy. Through this optics, things that had never looked into one another's face, confronted of a sudden, and illumined and comprehended through one another. For instance, opera and revolution. The two decisive innovations of the book are, on the one hand, the comprehension of the Dionysian phenomenon among the Greeks. It gives the first psychology thereof. It sees therein the one root of all Grecian art. On the other, the comprehension of Socratism. Socrates, diagnosed for the first time as the tool of Grecian dissolution, as a typical decadent, quote, rationality, end quote, against instinct, quote, rationality, quote, at any price, as a dangerous, as a life-undermining force. Throughout the whole book, a deep hostile silence on Christianity. It is neither Apollonian nor Dionysian. It negatives all aesthetic values. The only values recognized by the birth of tragedy. It is, in the widest sense, nihilistic. Whereas in the Dionysian symbol the utmost limit of affirmation is reached. Once or twice, the Christian priests are alluded to as a, quote, malignant kind of dwarves, end quote, as, quote, subterraneans, end quote. Two. This beginning is singular beyond measure. I had from my own inmost experience discovered the only symbol and counterpart of history. I had just thereby been the first to grasp the wonderful phenomenon of the Dionysian. And again, through my diagnosing Socrates as a decadent, I had given a wholly unequivocal proof of how little risk the trustworthiness of my psychological grasp would run of being weakened by some moralistic idiosyncrasy. To view morality itself as a symptom of decadence is an innovation, a novelty of the first rank in the history of knowledge. How far I had leaped in either case beyond the smug, shallow pate gossip of optimism contra pessimism. I was the first to see the intrinsic antithesis. Here, the degenerating instinct which, with subterranean vindictiveness, turns against life. Christianity 
the philosophy of Schopenhauer, in a certain sense already the philosophy of Plato. All idealistic systems have typical forms. And there, a formula of highest affirmation. Born of fullness and over fullness. A yea saying, without reserve to suffering's self, to guilt's self, to all that is questionable and strange in existence itself. This final, cheerfulest, exuberantly mad and merriest yea to life is not only the highest insight, it is also the deepest. It is that which is most rigorously confirmed and upheld by truth and science. Not, that is, is to be deduced. Not is dispensable. The phase of existence rejected by the Christians and other nihilists are even of an infinitely higher order in the hierarchy of values than that which the instinct of decadence sanctions, yea, Durst sanction. To comprehend this courage is needed, and as a condition thereof, a surplus of strength. For precisely in degree as courage dares to thrust forward, precisely according to the measure of strength does one approach truth. Perception. The yea saying to reality is as much a necessity to the strong as to the weak. Under the inspiration of weakness, cowardly shrinking, and flight from reality, the, quote, ideal, end quote, they are not free to perceive. The decadents have need of the lie. It is one of their conditions of self-preservation. Whoso not only comprehends the word Dionysian, but also grasps his self in this word, requires no refutation of Plato, or of Christianity, or of Schopenhauer. He smells the putrefaction. 3. To what extent I had just thereby found the concept, quote, tragic. End quote. The definitive perception of the psychology of tragedy I have but lately stated in The Twilight of the Idols, page 139, first edit. Quote, the affirmation of life, even in its most unfamiliar and severe problems, the will to life, enjoying its own inexhaustibility in the sacrifice of its highest types. That is what I called Dionysian. That is what I divined as the bridge to a psychology of the tragic poet. Not in order to get rid of terror and pity, not to purify from a dangerous passion by its vehement discharge. It was thus that Aristotle misunderstood it. But beyond terror and pity, to realize in fact the eternal delight of becoming, that delight which even involves in itself the joy of annihilating. In this sense, I have the right to understand myself to be the first tragic philosopher, that is, the utmost antithesis and antipode to a pessimistic philosopher. Prior to myself, there is no such translation of the Dionysian into the philosophic pathos. There lacks the tragic wisdom. I have sought in vain for an indication thereof, even among the great Greeks of philosophy, the thinkers of the two centuries before Socrates. A doubt still possessed me as touching Heraclitus, in whose proximity I, in general, begin to feel warmer and better than anywhere else. The affirmation of transiency and annihilation. 
to wit the decisive factor in a Dionysian philosophy. The yea saying to antithesis and war, to becoming, with radical rejection even of the concept, quote, being, end quote. That I must directly acknowledge as, of all thinking hitherto, the nearest to my own. The doctrine of, quote, eternal recurrence, end quote, that is, of the unconditioned and infinitely repeated cycle of all things. This doctrine of Zarathustra's might, after all, have been already taught by Heraclitus. At any rate, the portico which inherited well-nigh all its fundamental conceptions from Heraclitus shows traces thereof. 4. In this book speaks a prodigious hope. In fine, I see no reason whatever for taking back my hope of a Dionysian future for music. Let us cast a glance a century ahead. Let us suppose my assault upon two millenniums of anti-nature and man-vilification succeeds. That new party of life which will take in hand the greatest of all tasks— the upbreeding of mankind to something higher. Add thereto the relentless annihilation of all things degenerating and parasitic. Will again make possible on earth that too much of life, from which there also must needs grow again the Dionysian state. I promise a tragic age. The highest art in the yea saying to life, tragedy, will be born anew when mankind hath behind them consciousness of the hardest but most necessary wars, without suffering therefrom. A psychologist might still add that what I heard in my younger years in Wagnerian music had in general not to do with Wagner that when I described Wagnerian music, I described what I had heard, that I had instinctively to translate and transfigure all into the new spirit which I bore within myself. Translator's Note While the translator flatters himself that this version of Nietzsche's early work having been submitted to unsparingly scrutinizing eyes, is not altogether unworthy of the original. He begs to state that he holds twentieth-century English to be a rather unsatisfactory vehicle for philosophical thought. Accordingly, in conjunction with his friend Dr. Ernest Lacey, he has prepared a second, more unconventional translation. In brief, a translation which will enable one whose knowledge of English extends to, say, the period of Elizabeth, to appreciate Nietzsche in more forcible language, because the language of a stronger age. It is proposed to provide this second translation with an appendix, containing many references to the translated writings of Wagner and Schopenhauer, to the works of Potter, Browning, Burckhardt, Rohde, and others, and a summary and index. For help in preparing the present translation, the translator wishes to express his thanks to his friends, Dr. Ernest Lacey, Dr. James Waddell Tupper, Professor Harry Max Ferrin, Mr. James McCurdy, and Mr. Thomas Common. End of Appendix and Translator's Note Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia End of the Birth of Tragedy or Hellenism and Pessimism by Friedrich Nietzsche Translated by William Hausmann Thank you for listening.